Good afternoon, everyone. It is 4 p.m. in Melbourne, and let's kick off uh, the Global Victoria Alliance Program panel discussion, um, how to become a hidden champion in manufacturing. I'm Michael Zatinik, the deputy CEO of the German-Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce. We are delighted to have a great uh, group of um, panelists here with us today, but also, most importantly, a, uh, a great uh, number of registrations um, from uh, the manufacturing sector, primarily from Victoria. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here with us today. Um, before um, introducing um, the German Australian Chamber um, and starting the panel, we have the absolute great pleasure um, to be uh, welcomed by Tim Dillon. Um, Tim Dillon is the Agent General for Victoria to the United Kingdom, Commissioner for Victoria to Europe and Israel. Um, Tim um, has an outstanding career um, spanning over many decades, and we are absolutely delighted that he is joining us today live from London. Um, he has been um, the Agent General for Victoria to the United Kingdom and Commissioner for Europe and Israel since 30th of June 2020. Um, he represents the state government of Victoria um, to the United Kingdom, Europe and Israel, and is overseeing um, the government's trade and investment offices in London and Frankfurt and the representation in Israel. Um, he has a very distinguished um, career, um, both from the private and public sectors. And uh, recent highlights of Tim's career uh, include his um, uh, appointment as Commissioner for Victoria to Greater China um, between 2014 and 2020, to Southeast Asia based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia between 2009 and 2014, and to North Asia based in Tokyo between 2004 and 2009. Um, Obviously, Tim, over his distinguished career, has uh, supported many uh, businesses uh, from Victoria uh, across a range of industries and countries um, in order to facilitate cross-border trade and investment. Um, um, he has obviously very strong trade and investment facilitation capabilities um, and particularly focus areas of Tim's work in the past included renewable energy, um, the automotive sector, food, fiber, tourism, retail, and the infrastructure sector. So we're absolutely delighted to have um, Tim joining us this morning and welcoming us on behalf of the Victorian government. And uh, on behalf of the German Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, I can say that we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the Victorian uh, government uh, for this how-to series to support Victorian businesses, um, which is an absolutely uh, a pleasure to be working with the government and to be part of this program uh, managed by Global Victoria. Tim, can I hand over to you, please? Great, thank you very much, Michael. And um, good afternoon to those of you in Australia. And um, if we do have any joining from Germany or Europe, uh, good morning. Um, I think you covered my role very well, but perhaps um, a little bit of um, more, more bolts, uh, nuts and bolts around what we do. Um, we, have, we have offices uh, in London, but also in Frankfurt. They're two of our oldest offices in the, in the national network. And what we do is we provide support to Victorian companies that are looking to enter those markets and regions. So, you know, it could include things like connections and introductions. It could be advice on a market entry strategy or uh, regulatory advice that could be uh, participation and support for trade shows or, or letting you know of uh, Victorian trade missions to the region. So from the outset, let me say, um, please reach out if you're interested in exploring the markets. Um, you can reach out to our officers uh, if you're a Victorian company and to help. So um, look, it, it's fantastic to be here today um, representing Global Victoria and welcoming you all to the German Australia Chamber of Industry and Commerce event, Becoming a Hidden Champion in Manufacturing. So this is uh, the first in a three-part how-to series aimed at helping Victorian exports successfully enter the German market. And from the outset, let me say a big thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, We've got a great, great selection of companies that are going to provide their um, learnings and, and um, advice over, over doing business with 
the, the German market, and they include, you know, Byron Kennedy from Speed3D, Rolf Drone from EY, and Roseanne Jessup from Pills Australia and New Zealand. Um, you'll hear more about them and from them shortly. Um, just uh, over a year ago, the Victorian government, in response to the COVID pandemic and the impact it was having on our exporters, um, announced the $15.7 million export recovery package. And one of the key programs that's currently be being delivered as part of that package is what we're calling the Global Victoria Trade Alliance Program. So the German Australia Chamber of Industry and Commerce is one of our key Global, global Victoria Trade Alliance partners and has been a long-term partner of Global Victoria, playing an important role in promoting and supporting trade and investment between Australia and Germany. So under the Global Victoria Trade Alliance, uh, the German Australia Chamber of Industry and Commerce will deliver a series of events to build knowledge and connections uh, and enable pathways for Victorian businesses to engage in and export to Germany. So this event will be followed by events over the coming months on getting into German supply chains, setting up a company and the Australia EU free trade agreement and what that may mean for Victorian companies. Um, just a little bit about the history between um, Germany and Victoria. We've had an office in Frankfurt since 1982. It's one of the oldest um, offices in our networks. Um, and today, uh, Germany overall for Australia is the ninth largest trading partner with two-way trade totaling um, around $21.2 billion. Um, for Victoria, it's the number one export market in Europe. Um, German, German is one of, well, Germans are one of the largest ethnic groups in Victoria. And um, showing a little bit of history here, it's even believed that um, we can credit our wine industry to the early migration of um, Germans to Australia back in the early 1900s, and they brought their know-how around wine. So a big thank you to them for that, for, for helping us develop what has become one of our most famous export products. We're home, we're home to a number of leading German companies, including Siemens, Bosch, Deutsche Bank, Allianz, Inogi, RWE, BOC Lind, Ramondas, BASF, Bayer and Thyssen, Krupp, just to name a few. And while German is, Germany is known for these global leading companies, what we're hearing about today is um, often the unseen ones and what, what they call the hidden champions. And these are credited as being the backbone of Germany's economy and export industry. As you'll hear today, hidden champions is a term coined by the German businessman, Hermann Simon. Hidden champions are internationally highly successful privately owned companies whose names are practically unknown even in Germany. But as I said before, um, really are driving that high-end um, manufacturing and export um, from the country. Um, they're often lead, world leading in manufacturing production and the, the processes that they deliver. Um, Herman, who I mentioned before, equates Germany's success in manufacturing and export to these hidden champions. And so we're hoping today that you can learn from their successes and some of the principles that they've applied and approach that to your, um, or, or apply that in your developing your um, strategy and uh, I suppose uh, exporting into the market. We've got a number of Victorian companies that are already doing um, great work in Germany and succeeding. Um, companies such as IFM, ANZ in the finance sector, CSL Burring will be known to all of you in the pharmaceutical area, Gray Innovation for medical devices, New Farm, Computer Share, and Telstra, to name a few. And we're going to hear about a great company today from Byron Kennedy of Speed, Speed 3D. Um, we're also having great success in the region. I'm going to leave it here today, but um, I look forward to hearing further from today's speaker, speakers. And um, I really encourage those of you online today to reach out to the Victorian government um, if we can support you in your endeavours to enter the market, not just the, the German market, but also any market around the world. We've got a network of 24 officers globally. So thank you, Michael and Chamber, for your work. Um, back to you.
Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Tim, for this insightful welcome and uh, absolutely great to hear the support available through Global Victoria for Victorian businesses um, um, going international. And of course, uh, what is of great interest for us, particularly going into the German market. And hopefully today we can really show a little bit of what it takes um, um, to be a hidden champion and how uh, we can support Victorian businesses in that through our distinguished um, panelists, um, Roseanne and Byron, and our moder uh, moderated um, through Rolf Drone. But we will come to them in a moment. Just let me um, introduce you for those of you not familiar with the German Australian Chamber, just for a quick um, moment uh, about what we do and how the Chamber can support you as well. Um, in your um, growth uh, and from for your international um, uh, journey. So, um, uh, of course, uh, I, before I starting uh, the whole discussion, we of course want to acknowledge um, that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Gadigal of the Aurora Nation as traditional custodians. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. And I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of, of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. The German Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce um, has been founded in 1977 and we are part of a global um, chamber network. You can see our vision, mission, uh, uh, and values on this slide. And particularly, I want to point you out to our mission. Um, it is to create value for our members, customers, and government stakeholders by increasing bilateral business opportunities and develop growth initiatives in the strategic overlap of both countries. And uh, one such overlap is particularly strong in manufacturing. And this is what we are talking today about with really relevant case studies um, and why we do uh, that and what we can offer companies is our service portfolio, which of course includes a number of activities like market research. Uh, we can, uh, that can either be a, a Kurzrecherche, which is our nice German terminology for short um, research or full market analysis. We can offer business partner matching. We can offer company background checks. We organize business delegations um, as well as we can organize and uh, conduct uh, intercultural workshops uh, for your business to understand uh, for example, the German um, business mentality in more depth uh, relevant for your market segment and for your industry. And last but not least, we collaborate closely, not just with Global Victoria, which of course has been a really long-term partner for us and, and, uh, uh, and of course also the partner for this event series as outlined by Tim, but also with Germany Trade and Invest, um, the Economic Development Agency of the Federal Republic of Germany, and we can bring you in touch with that agency as well. Um, without um, going into too much uh, detail, of course, you can reach out either to myself or to our through our website germany.org.eu to find out more about the chamber work and how we can support your business. So let me uh, uh, introduce our MC for the for today's um, uh, webinar, and we're delighted to have Rolf Drohn with us. He is. Um, Executive Director at EY. He is also um, Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the uh, German Australian Chamber and our Treasurer. And uh, just uh, a very, very short summary of Rolf's distinguished um, career. He came to Australia in 1997. Um, he now specializes in international tax and tax policy, and he is leading EY's um, German business network in Australia. And he has been a really long uh, term partner and member of the German Australian Chamber. He started in our young professional um, group, um, then became uh, with EY one of our executive partner members, later one of our premium partners, our highest uh, membership level, and uh, also, of course, a uh, uh, very valuable member of our policy advisory committee. 
and then became uh, became a board member and now is vice chair of the board and um, treasurer. So we're absolutely delighted to have someone so competent um, moderating today's discussion. Wolf, can I hand over to you, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, really agreeing with Tim, uh, you know, the, the concept hidden champion uh, formed by uh, Hermann, Professor Hermann Simon 33 years ago. In a way, he's a hidden champion himself because he not only invented the term, but um, uh, filled it with such life that you can't occupy the topic without going deep into his body of research. Uh, he started looking into it when he was asked, how do you explain, a very simple question, how do you explain the success of German company in the export markets? And you really are tempted to, to say, well, it's the big companies. Um, and that really holds true for, for many other uh, countries, but not Germany. Hidden champion, oxymoron? No. Rather, it's a term describing a champion at least top three, if not the world, almost unrivaled in a niche market, highly valued by customer, but largely unknown, hidden to the public. Some hidden champions are listed, but the large majority are private uh, family-run businesses with a maximum turnover of 5 billion euro. The threshold keeps going up, because these companies keep growing. Professor Simon derived his um, uh, classification schema from initially 500 companies, which he studied in detail. This schema is now used to identify new hidden champions, which uh, now more than 3,000 companies are recognized and counting. At least 40% of them are German-based. We acknowledge Simon Kucher Strategy Consultants first identifying seven le lessons those wanting to become the next hidden champion should follow. We ap express our appreciation uh, for how Professor Simon's work is freely shared on the internet. We will hear from Roseanne Yesop later how she strongly believes all of the following lessons count. You cannot skip one. So let's start. You need extremely ambitious targets. And not just that, you need to uh, pursue these targets relentlessly until you then get a sizable margin to the next competitor, double or more. It's 7% growth, that's quickly done if it's compounding. And the ownership structure will set you up initially with uh, patient capital so you can get a lung and art and a deep breath. You get the technology right. But then once it's ready to be um, in the market, you go and you go hard. And you do that with a lot of focus and depth. That's the second lesson. And when we are talking about focus, we're talking about a narrow focus with strong vertical integration deep into the supply chain. And that also now counts a lot of digitalization. What is paramount, and we'll hear this from our panelists, is a strong belief in your product or technology. And the money goes into that technology, not to shareholders. It is about technology. Machine engineering presents 41% of hidden champions, industrial products, 19, plant engineering, 12, and then automotive, electric, 10 each, or thereabouts. Now, the next step, number three, is globalization. And you need that because the focus makes your market strong. But then globalization, if you succeed, make the market plenty big again. You may start out with critical markets and create close relationships there. Globalization must drive the growth ahead of diversification. The Germans would say, Schuster bleibt bei deinen Leisten, Koppler stick to your last, very German stuff. The fourth element we want to look at or lesson is innovation. Investment in R&D is double that of larger rivals. Patent intensity per thousand employees 
is five times higher at a fifth of the cost. Market and technology are equally important. And it's not just the product, productivity, how you make these products is 29% higher compared to middle, the Mittelstand generally. The next element facilitated through your excellent employees is regular and frequent contact. 50% of your employees, if you're hidden um, champions, pick up the phone and talk directly to customers. And that then creates advice and system integration, not just here's the product. And you know you and control your supply chain, and that in turn makes it then easier to pilot and commercialize new ideas. And now comes the, the important stuff, loyalty and highly qualified employees. Staff turnover of those employees who stay more than 24 months, frequently stay until requirement, uh, retirement, pardon me, 71% um, at least 10 years. So maybe there's turnover early on because uh, you know, there is demand on the employees, but once they're integrated in the company, they stay. And uh, then uh, you have a high number of qualified, highly qualified employees. And these employees with their qualifications clearly become the foundation of your superiority. And in the center, if you look at the um, scheme that uh, Professor Simon has um, created is strong leadership. You have strong personalities that identify themselves with the company. Purpose is at the core. As simple, that may be as simple as, uh, as we will hear from Pils, uh, creating a, a safe work environment, but it's certainly never profit alone. The average tenure of a CEO is 10 years double that of listed companies. And the longevity of these companies is extraordinary. 34, 34%, 61 years or older, 22, 100 years plus, and a staggering 13% of these hidden um, champions have been around for 150 years. Everywhere uh, in Solf looked at was what Australia could learn from the German Mittelstand. And he came up with planning over profit Skilled workers are the future and innovate within your niche. So which companies may have already done this? Well, Speed 3D, more soon, Orica for explosives, carbon revolutions for carbon wheels. You heard about CSL Plasma before, Chat for Palace, Aristocrat Laser for gaming machines, Sutton tools for cutting, cutting tools, and the list goes on. And one of my favorite surprise stories in Melbourne was when I learned that FNB Finder from Berlin uh, was responsible for many of the vacuum and beamline technology in the synchro Australian synchrotron uh, in Clayton. There's a hidden champion index and that looks at brand and company performance based on peer review. Um, and that's led by a company called Herrenknecht uh, Tunnel um, uh, Boring Machines. Otto Bock and Lursen, but there are many examples of these uh, top ranking companies operating in Victoria. Uh, and on another topic, um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Roseanne Yesop, the Managing Director of PILS and Industrial Automation um, of the Australian New Zealand um, a subsidiary based in Melbourne. Roseanne is also a non executive director on the board of Australian Packaging and Process Machinery, uh, PILS is headquartered in Ostfildern. I'm sure you heard about Ostfildern, Germany, um, and manufactures industrial automation and safety components. Their mission is to make the world safer and more sustainable uh, place through components, systems, and services that uh, support the safe automation of plants, machinery globally, including Australia. Roseanne has a proven track record in major industry sectors such as mining, food, beverage, and energy for over 26 years and has a unique understanding of industry uh, 4.0 and digitalization of manufacturing. Next, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Byron Kennedy, 
uh, CEO of three, uh, Speed3D, uh, a serial entrepreneur, having co-founded the spin-off company, first, first spin-off company from Charles Darwin University before exiting to New York Stock Exchange listed company, Regal Deloitte of PESCO. Uh, product successes have included world record holding solar cars, innovative electric motors, electric bicycles, pool pumps, and more. He's currently the co-founder and CEO of three, Speed 3D, a high-speed metal 3D printing company. Speed 3D is an innovative supplier of metal-based additive manufacturing technology. Speed 3D focuses on the development, assembly, and distribution of machines, integration, integrated system solutions based on that patent and cold spray technology. The products enable faster, significantly faster, lower cost and more scalable production than traditional metal printing techniques for copper and aluminum and other materials. And that um, opens up our panel uh, discussion. Rose, then let me start with you. Um, I understand and this is not offensive, I think, to say that PILS is an invisible technology leader for safety. Also, I watched a little clip on PILS and that involved, uh, I think, some of the European staff uh, in, a, in a cable car and they're looking out and they see the PILS sign somewhere and say, like, oh, wonderful, we are safe. So, but largely invisible uh, technology leader um, for safety, pro uh, productivity in Industry 4.0. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, your control systems and the application in transport and um, production or mining? Sure, thank you, Rolf, and, and thanks for being here. I actually feel very honored uh, to be a part of this panel discussion and and uh, really look forward to um, what we might be able to share with uh, with you all today. Um, I'm also actually feeling very honored to represent PILS because Rolf, as you said, that it's definitely a great example of a German hidden champion company. Um, as you pointed out, we're headquartered in uh, Osfelden. It's a fairly little village actually. Um, uh, near Stuttgart though, uh, I guess our big brother is Bosch, very nearby. Um, mm. So when you fly in to visit Pills headquarters, you you uh, you think you're flying into Bosch. <laughs> mm. uh, so uh, um, look, great to be here. Uh, really good question, Rolf, um, around what Pills does, and and that comes back to to one of those core pillars of being a hidden champion, that focus and depth. Uh, you know, uh, we've been around since the 1950s. Um, were, the, were the plan to be around for forever. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, you know, we started out as an automation company, a very innovative um, automation company in Germany, really pushing barriers. Ironically, back in the time where automation was seen as a risk to safety, <laughs> and most were against it, and evolving to a company that automates safely. Um, you know, so although you know, we were an early inventor of the of, of PLCs and automation, we, we did then create the world's first safety relay, and that was kind of how we transitioned from core automation into finding our niche in that safety space. And we grew very strong in that safety space, and and you know, over the coming years have expanded out across uh, forty different countries, forty different subsidiaries, um, and. Uh, Really, you know, if you're in manufacturing, you will probably know the Pills brand. If you're not, you probably definitely will not know the Pills brand, but we are the gold standard in safety and are known for um, that safety relay and safe, safe control systems. And, and more recently, the services that we provide as well with regards to safety consulting and, and safety training, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, no, wonderful. Um, now, this is not the right question to ask you because Dick digitalization is part um, of your DNA and, and you do industry 4.0, but do you have any explanation why, why it could be that some would say, well, if there's a weakness of the, the German hidden uh, champions, uh, you know, it could be digitalization. I mean, is it uh, maybe just because uh, the le lack of representation perhaps in, in B2C? Uh, because my impression is that, um, you know, the hidden champions are pretty on top of their game when it comes to 
digitalization. They are. Uh, the Pills family has been directly involved in actually in, in even coming up with the terminology Industry 4.0. Uh, Susan Kunchat was on the committee that invented the name and concept of, of Industry 4.0 and we are we are um, consistently contributing to you know the standards that can underpin Industry 4.0 especially in terms of communications protocols because you know, Industry 4.0 is all about information and flow isn't it at the end of the day so um so it's a surprising assumption because it's certainly not what I've seen within the pills environment. That said, our, uh, as you say, that B2C offering, you know, we're only just working on that right now in terms of offering, of, of, of beginning to offer our customers services in the cloud. Mm. Mm. So, and really some of that was trusting the cloud. Mm. Oh, wonderful. Uh, now, uh, you know, we, we spoke about, uh, you know, should we revisit the, the seven lessons and uh, in our, uh, you know, first run of this, uh, it was you who said like, well, you have to do all seven um, and you have to do them well. And um, I, I put to you that the EY Mittelstand's uh, barometer who's looking at the Mittelstand, uh, so even, you know, the smaller um, uh, companies as well, uh, construction companies, uh, and, and their, you know, talent did come up, you know, qualified um, staff is an issue. Um, and you almost just laughed and said like, no, it's 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 not an issue. Um, can you tell me a little bit uh, about how that's done and and how, how do you do it? That generation of loyalty. Um, yeah, I, that, I mean that is one of those seven pillars, isn't it? Uh, having loyal loyal and highly qualified employees. I, that really starts with strong leadership that sets a, a set of values that everyone can relate to and can live and breathe every day. Um, you will find that in, in SMEs like ours, we, you know, we don't tolerate those that don't fit into the, the core values of the company. So that's probably why you see that higher turnover rate in that first 24 months. Um, but if you are living and breathing the, the, the core values of these hidden champions, then it's likely because it fits with your core values. You know, I, li I like to see that the world's going to be a better place and that I can help with that. And uh, so, of course, I'm going to um, have my values match very well with Pills, who has the same intent. Um, so I think once you can relate to a company more at a core values level, um, as opposed to a skills match, that's when you get that, that sense of belonging. And that sense of belonging means that companies like Pills, who treat their employees with utter respect during a crisis, their primary primary action was to retain employees. You know, whereas you'll often find the uh, more commercially orientated larger companies will take action and cut to save costs during tough times. You know, the hidden champions don't do that. They actually take the opposite approach and go, right, during this time, we really need to look after our employees. It is really tough for them. Um, and there's very strict instructions not to touch headcount during those times. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try in a minute to maybe uh, find out whether there's any any weakness, uh, but uh, maybe uh, bring bring Byron into the um, in, into the uh, discussion. And uh, you know, I think what is pretty clear here: we're not talking about these sort of three D printers that we can buy at Aldi now. Um, uh, also, I think some of them have them at home and play around with them. Um, so I, I have a go at what you do. This is, uh, I think you use the, the patent and cold spray technology to uh, uh, use supersonic speed to cold fuse powder particles uh, with precision to form copper or a million parts. Uh, that's my attempt, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you can explain uh, a little bit more um, when, when you've found out you had a winner on, on on your hands and, and, and what your te technology is and, and, and where it's heading. Um, yeah, no, uh, th and thanks for the introduction. Um, we describe it a little bit like, um, let's say bugs hitting a windshield. So you're driving <laughs> along in your car and there's a grasshopper and it goes splat and it'll stick to your wind windscreen. So if you then do that in reverse and instead of, uh, it, driving if you shoot grasshoppers or, or in our case if you're shooting metal powder so if you shoot a metal powder quick enough it will when it hits a surface it will then bond and then mm. stick and if you then can control where you shoot that metal powder you can then fill parts so that's the premise of the technology which we sell 
Uh, the advantage is that it's then very, very fast to build parts. So typically we will be about 100 to 1,000 times faster than other 3D printing technologies. And what that does is then bring the cost down dramatically. So instead of being, you know, building a part which will take, um, let's say, two days, you know, we, we might do that in, in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So 3D printing, metal 3D printing, which is the world that we live in, has been successfully deployed, but in low volume applications. So think of medical, think of dental, those applications. So very sophisticated parts. But if you can now print parts very, very quickly, you can bring the cost down, you open up a much more broader market. So the market could include um, heavy industry, so rail, marine, oil and gas, defence, those areas now which, which have critical infrastructure that need to keep running. And, and that's the kind of markets which we're targeting with this technology. So it's, it's taking 3D printing out of the laboratories and really putting it on the factory put on the factory floor, putting it, you know, at a shipyard on an oil and gas rig, you know, being able to solve real world problems where we haven't been able to do it in the past. So it's a fascinating area uh, and something we, you know, we're very, very passionate about. Yeah, I, I feel a bit under pressure because uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be many Australian manufacturers listening in and say like, boy, I mean, that, you know, that is great technology. And, and I suspect, uh, uh, there'd be many out there that have that technology, uh, but still, you know, don't quite how how they should grow and how they should uh, explore the world market, which sort of uh, sounds easy, but um, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, it's it's not. Um, I guess the advantage uh, you have in a way that um, I think Germans would call you a, a tüftler, um, and, and I think that's uh, to translate it. I can be it's an affectionate term um, because it's a uh, it's an inventor who, who likes uh, finicky things. And I think that um, was part of uh, your, your story when, when you actually took a, um, a product all the way to the, uh, to the New York Stock Exchange. Um, can you briefly talk, was that, uh, is that helpful now or is, is this a completely different, uh, different uh, journey you're on with uh, your current uh, product? Yeah, no, a different product, but very similar journey. So it's about really identifying a need um, for a particular product. So, you know, in, in that particular example, uh, we were in the university, developed an electric motor for a solar car. So no one, mm. you know, solar cars obviously are not a um, commercially viable product. You know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're a tool to, to research essentially. Mm. Um, but what happens if you could then find a market for that technology? And, and in this case, it was um, applications of that electric motor in things like electric bikes, ceiling fans, pool pumps, and other applications like that. So it's a really about then saying, where can we use this technology? What, what is the need? What, what is the problem that it is solving? And, and that's what any entrepreneur, that's what any company is really looking for is, uh, you know, what, what is my niche? You know, wh where is my focus? And you, you'll see that in, in the, um, the principles we're talking about. Where's the focus and, and what, how can I help our customers? And um, so it really taught us about um, business. It taught us about, um, you know, focusing on, on solving someone's problems. And, um, and, and in that journey, we, we actually had this, this issue in prototyping or, or building part, metal parts. And, um, and we saw 3D printing coming, but the reality at the time, it was just too expensive and too slow. Mm. So when we finished up at that previous company, it was then, you know, could we develop a technology which, which would solve this cost and speed and quality issue that, that we, we had when we were in the electric motor industry, but then you know that same problem is then replicated in many many other industries. So certainly, that early experience um, helped us in in growing this company uh, quicker and to the stage we're up to now. Yeah, that brings me to the next question. I can I ask you: Are you familiar with the the seven lessons or hidden champion, or is it just natural? Because uh, the, the the one thing that that you know, stood out with me when we spoke yesterday is it just came back to technology, right? And if, if that technology is unique and it serves a need and the like, 
the market will follow. And um, you know, if, if you then grow quickly and the like, I think other things will uh, uh, fall into place. So, uh, are you familiar with uh, you know the the, the concepts uh, uh, and maybe related to that? I mean, one of the uh, the, the hallmarks is this uh, idea of uh, you know a little debt. Uh, you you don't do M and As. Uh, you know, patient capital. You 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 grow with ambitious go goals, but steadily, etc. Um, so I guess what I'm asking you: Are you familiar with the concepts and and uh, um, uh, yeah, which ones? Uh, are you applying naturally? Which ones can't come as a su surprise to you? Mm. Uh, when when I was um, invited to to this talk, I was not um, aware of the the principles, um, mm. but I was let's say pleasantly pleased when I read them because they do feel like um, these are all principles which we follow. So no, I wasn't aware of them, but when I read through them and went looked at them and said. I think we actually do all of those. Um, mm. So, so that was nice to be able to look at the principles uh, without without uh, having the knowledge of them and say yes, we do apply them today. You know, so, some of the principles um, are more important at different stages of business. So, you know, when you're an early stage company, it, it may be about you know the innovation. You know, how we're going to be better than 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 the existing products. But as you evolve, it, it may then come down to the strategy um, and, and about how you then um, attract and retain good staff. So, so they all, um, you, you, the importance of the principles change over time is, is probably what, what we see. So, you know, today, um, you know, the, probably the one that stands out for us is, is the focus. You know, when, when you're going into a new market such as Germany, um, you need to focus. You can't be everything to anyone. You know, e everything to everyone. So you'll you'll have a lot of customers who will say, uh, "We want you to go in this this direction," and that's great. But it may not be your focus. It may not be what you are actually good at. So, so at the moment, I would say the key one for us is focus. You know, keep the focus on on solving those problems which we're good at. Don't get distracted. There's plenty of distractions out there. Um, but really focusing and, you know, as you, as you really get that foothold, you can then branch out into those other areas, but, but keep your focus, especially when you're entering a new market. Okay, well, I, I think we now learn, you know, about the technology, both for uh, PILTS uh, as well as uh, Speed 3D. Uh, let, let's, I, I will try before we then maybe go into the space, uh, because, you know, I, I think the bulk of the audience is about you know how how can we replicate the success? Uh, how, how can we uh, become a hidden champion uh, in manufacturing the world market? But um, let me go back to to you, Rosen. Uh, in, in terms of what the the Mittelstand is sort of um, a little bit uh, uh, grappling with, uh, you know, I said skills was was uh, uh, number one, um, and you said well that's that's not an issue. Uh, energy uh, or input costs uh, generally is an issue or or then cyber um you know it kind of issues um is there any anything where there's a jinx jinx in, the, in your armor or are you sort of just uh, traveling along nicely pills currently is traveling along nicely but it actually has been a, a few tough years um actually for a lot of german companies with the recession that hit in 2018 so we've we've had some really tough years that we've had to ride through um, we came, came through that Germany recession straight into a, a fairly crippling cyber attack and then, you know, rapid digitalization um, internally uh, on the back of that cyber attack um, through to two years of, of, of COVID and counting. So um, it, it's not been easy uh, during that time, but I think that's where if you have got those seven core pillars, uh, it provides resilience, you know, globalization, for example, with regards to supply, supply chain and having manufacturing locations in different areas of the world. That's, that's really helped during the challenges of supply chain issues throughout that COVID, um, especially the first, first year of 2020. Um, so, you know, each one of those pillars, you know, we're now coming into this period of mass resignation, but if you've looked after your staff during that tough time, um, you know, all of the senior management took a 20% pay cut for two years 
to help us get through that recession and then subsequently moving into COVID. Uh, that really strength of, sends a strong message to the rest of the employees that we are you know, here to look after you. We value you and, and um, in return, they re maintain uh, a greater sense of loyalty. Uh, and it's a very genuine, you know, this isn't done to forcefully gener generate loyalty. It, it's just a very natural in a company, especially a family owned company that, that holds holds good core values. So um, I wouldn't say we don't go through tough times uh, at all. Um, it's just that you have that resilience if you get those ingredients, those seven ingredients, right, to, to be able to ride through. And uh, if you're not after the quick win and you're after the, you know, long-term, a long-term healthy business with modest sustainable, sustainable goals, uh, looking after your staff, then, you know, but constantly, you know, our motto, is our strengthen our strengths, shape our future. That's our internal motto. It really is all about coming back to our core. What's our core? What are we good at? Look after our core, um, maintain that focus, but always be curious, you know, what is happening out there and how could we um, take our core either into new markets uh, or provide them in a different way like that digitalization and offering, you know, from the B2C, which by the way, is a little bit conflicting because, you know, one of the cores we value the most is that closeness to customer. Mm. And so giving that customer a different interface where it's not with a human being and instead it's with something up in the cloud is kind of, you know, is counterintuitive to us uh, wanting to maintain that closeness to our customers. So mm. yeah, we're definitely not perfect, <laughs> but, no, the, the one but we have that, that resilience. The one area that surprised me, because forgetting hidden change or the little stuff, I always had that idea that, you know, there's the older generation bowing out and then there's, uh, you know, what about succession planning? And uh, if the barometer uh, that I read through EY is correct, then that, that wasn't really on, on the horizon. That, that surprised me, I have to say. No, because of the length of tenure of so many people, uh, not just at headquarters, but all around the world. Uh, one of my impressive colleagues, Rachel, she's the managing director of, of our China subsidiary, which is our second largest subsidiary, um, second behind Germany, of course. Uh, you know, she's been with Pills for over 20 years, so that there's such a great depth of, of talent and experience within mm. um within pills that there's really no fear or worry around succession planning and then also the pills family themselves you know we 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 know the children of the of the of thomas and susie and we know that they are being prepped to one day take over the reins yeah okay wonderful and i know thomas was quite open to a trade fairs talking about cyber attacks and etc et so we're not it's not as hard hitting but uh, thank you for for also sharing some of the um uh, you know, um, things in the armor. Uh, Byron, I could imagine for you, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, but uh, w once uh, you combine your technology with speed, I think you were talking about mass production. So forget about prototype and um, application seem endless. Are, are there any clouds on the horizon for you? And sometimes we hear that growing too quickly can be a problem or, or, or the like. Um, is it all smooth sailing for you? Um, I'd, I'd love to say that, but um, yeah, there's always challenges. Um, and as a small business, you go through different phases. So, you know, we're, we're um, let's say five years old, roughly. Um, you know, you start with um, two people, you, you grow to 10, you grow to 20, and, and you know, you continue to grow. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're about 50 people now. So, we're, and we're going through, you know, a period of rapid growth. Um, uh, putting people on both locally and in a global region, um, Europe and, and the US. So you've got all the challenges that are associated with growing your team um, and then, um, you know, maintaining the culture within the, within the company as well. So hmm. how do you maintain a, a culture when you're, when you're five people? That's relatively straightforward, but you know, how do you then roll that out to 50 people? Mm. Um, and, and then beyond that, you know, up to 500 or 5,000, depending on where, where you are on your, your growth journey. So, um, so there's some of the, you know, the, the challenges that we're going through. Um, and and when, you, when you do grow, you, you've got to be aware of, of any resources, resource constraints, um, you know, be it funding, be it people, be it, be it whatever. 
um, and and everyone would love to grow very very quickly. Um, but you know that there, there are these constraints. So so that's where that focus piece comes in that I talked about previously. Um, mm. You know, grow as quickly as you can, but but be aware that um, you know you, you can't do everything um, on day one. You know, it, it might be next year that you want to achieve that that goal, um, or the year after even. So. Um, and along the way, yeah, there'll be those speed humps, um, which which will derail you for for a period of time. But um, you just got to get it back on and 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 keep going for that goal. And does it sort of mean you know obviously no longer just uh, Victorian talent, but global talent, and maybe more generally, um, you know, I spoke to Roseanne and she uh, said like, well, you know, a lot of staff, yes, might be sent to headquarter, but then out back into the world. Is is it? similar uh, with you that, that virtually every employee goes through uh, a training at uh, at uh, Victorian headquarters before then being uh, deployed and you know what's your attitude towards the, the German apprenticeships uh, do you find good good workers there and, and maybe even the the famous um, you know participation of employees in decision making so you know a whole raft of questions basically in growing your employment force and uh, growing into a global employment um, force, I guess. Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating. You know, COVID has has obviously changed that dynamics. Um, I, I've got employees that we've never met. You know, what, one of our directors I've never met. He's been on the board for eighteen months, but he lives in Brisbane, and you know, Mel Melbourne hasn't been the easiest place to get to for the last two years. So, um, it the the training for us has really, well, COVID has really put, forced us to put everything digital. Um, so we've got much, much better resources in terms of training, in terms of videos, in terms of support. And um, so, no, we, we have no need to bring people to headquarters. We, we'd like to, you know, we, we'd like to meet everyone. But um, the, the world that we live in is now requiring that um, uh, people need to be trained wherever they live. Um, mm they may or may not even come into the office, even if they're in Melbourne, obviously. So we, we are really, you know, and, and that's, I suppose that's a, the advantage of being a small company is you can put all the digital resources in from day one. So, um, so we, we don't need people at headquarters, you know, if they want to work in um, Brisbane, live in Brisbane, if they want to live in Kalgoorlie, um, as long as there's a decent internet connection, um, more than comfortable. So, um, training, training's changing. The the world in terms of where people um, commute from, train changes. Mm. Um, but yeah, as a company, you just need to adapt and 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 do that quickly. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think the topic is how to become uh, a you know hidden champion, globally successful in, in manufacturing. So uh, probably has been a while, Rosen, since Pils uh, developed the the network, but. Uh, would you sort of looking back on the history, how, how Pils did it, uh, be willing to, to give it like a, a few high level pointers, how, how, how it's done? Yeah, with a lot of passion, <laughs> a lot of passion and a lot of focus and a lot of energy. Uh, number one, you better believe that what you've got is great. Uh, I think, you know, if you underpin that with knowing you're really solving something for a uh, for another business, another person, um, you know, which for pills, as I mentioned, you know, that automation was seen as unsafe. They wanted to fix that. Hence, they were a pioneer in, in the invention of, of safe automation of plants. And, and it stayed that way ever since. They found that niche and they've uh, stayed within that niche and become the gold standard of uh, industrial safety when it comes to industrial safety components. So, and then of course, you, you, that niche can be broadened by then expanding globally, knowing you're good, using that gold standard, that brand, those references, um, you know, having a good program around managing these international accounts. You may be you know, here in Australia, but there are international companies here in Australia that you can establish that relationship with and then take that relationship globally in a partnership with them. And Pills has done that exceptionally well where uh, you know companies initially would have been headquartered in Europe and then of course we're doing work for them partnering with them globally either on their safety and in industrial safety training programs um, or perhaps the way they conduct industrial um, uh, machine safety risk assessments uh, through to standardizing on on 
high quality industrial safety components in their manufacturing facilities. So, so really just that, that, that focus and passion and belief in what you do and that, and that you're making a difference. And I could hear that really clearly from Byron. It yeah. just comes naturally, you know, in fact, uh, when I was reading some of these papers around the uh, around these seven lessons from hidden hidden champions um, hidden hidden champions, it was a sentence that really resonated for me, which is in essence they apply common sense. And and uh, mm. you know Byron didn't know about those those seven definitions, but they truly are common sense. Once you read it, you go, yeah, that that makes sense that you would need to do those seven really well to become successful. But there's some deep layers underneath that I think that you know um, businesses should explore and and not just look at it at a surface level and really go back to their values to ensure that they they're walking the walk and not just talking the talk with regards to those seven values and that that walking the walk starts with a, a strong leadership team that are, is exhibiting those values. And, and, and maybe let's be clear too like when we talk about niche right it's the niche of the technology but then um you told me, you know, you go to trade shows and you think, well, you know, we do food manufacturing, we do mining, we do this, we do, uh, you know, cable cars, we do leisure parks. We, um, so you're not shy to bring your technology into anything that moves, but it's just that the, I guess, the, the groundbreaking world leading technology, that's sort of where you keep investing to be ahead of the game. Is, is, is that roughly correct or? That's right. That's right. And as more and more sectors become automated against some, some of the bigger uh, ones right now are, um, you know, that wa waste recycling sector. So we're seeing a, a lot of uh, um, business come out of that in Australia right now with the, you know, installation of, of new, new plants to manage, you know, smart ways of recycling waste. And waste tends to be bulky and, and risky to move around. And therefore, um, you know, those manufacturing systems need to be... Uh, uh, keeping their people that are working around those systems really safe with with all the stuff that goes on. I don't know if you've been yeah. in a, it's a recycling facility, but um, you know, it can be pretty hazardous if you uh, don't have the right safe systems on on board. So um, so yeah, we're, we we certainly keep on top of where uh, industry is going. It, 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 you know, right, you're right. You know, we, we do a, a lot of work with Ansto actually in their particle acceleration um, area. We're actually we we're uh, the uh, control systems for. The Ansto facility over in in uh, Sydney, or New South Wales. So we sort of we're you're right we're we're everywhere. We're you're right. We're also fairly hidden because we're fairly niche. It's not we're not, not going to have big labels all over the, uh, you know, with really big machines like Byron's got. Um, you know, we're just going to be little yellow boxes <laughs> inside control panels, typically with some switches on gates, etc. So uh, yeah, slightly more hidden. But when people see something yellow in a control cabinet or. Uh, or on a, on a safety gate, for example, they're probably going to assume it's pills. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't want to eat into the Q&A time, but uh, the, the question I did ask for Zara, I would love to uh, discuss with you, Byron, as well. Uh, so first up, you know, like uh, your perspective in terms of um, advice you're, you're willing to, to, to give to, to the participants. Um, uh, and then, then next, maybe we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the. Uh, niche market, but also you, uh, how do you diversify to, you know, I mean, the, the automotive industry is in transition, etc. But I think you're covering enough uh, industry sectors. So uh, can I ask those two questions to you as well? Yeah, let, let me talk about going global. Um, I think it's a really interesting thing, you know, trying to enter overseas markets. Um, and, and we, we actually um, use the resources of, of the people on the call. Um, mm. So we used Global Victoria and the offices in Frankfurt and, and contacted them and said, you know, how are we going to enter this new market on day one? You know, we were a very small company. Um, and, um, and other government retailers, you know, Austrade and, and the, the government departments are really there to help you. Um, you must, I must admit, you have to fight through the levels of bureaucracy to, to get to the right people, but, but they are there. And they are there to, to support and help you. And um, that, that was sort of one of the keys. Um, and, and then it's about um, understanding when, when you do go global, you're going to invest in, and you're probably going to lose money to start with. Um, it's, it's not about just opening office and, and being profitable day one. There's different cultures, different uh, customers. Um, and you know, it, it's a slog and a journey to begin with. Um, the rewards are there, um, 
and and you've got to really just stick with it. So um, so I suppose there's some of the learnings that that I would like to pass on. Um, use the resources, use the people that um, are there to support you. You know, either Australian governments or you know, if you're going into the Germany, you know, Germany has great resources and, and people there to help as well. And they're they're looking to to bring companies into Germany. So use all those resources, um, and then um, and and then just buckle down for the ride and and uh, and work really hard. That's, that's probably some of the key things. And then how how do you go from your your you know your patent and coach by technology, but uh, boy, what what you can do with that uh, you know all the way to mass manufacturing and uh, the boxes that you ship them around are getting bigger and uh, mm. uh, so. You know, I think it's, tell us a little bit more, like how you diversify from, uh, I remember you did a little uh, at the German Chamber golf event, uh, I think you printed like one putter uh, that was uh, up for grabs for people that play better golf than I do. Um, and it was, uh, you know, printed in front of our eyes in, uh, in an in a, in a orange box, etc. But you've gone way beyond that. It was several years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're getting bigger and bigger and better it's a it's a simple expression um the the printers you know as you said you know we started with with putters so you know things the size of a baseball then you work your way up to to football size parts and then golf clubs and and now we're going bigger and bigger so really it's about helping our customers in in what they want um and for us it, it is getting to those larger and larger parts and actually putting the printers on site. So when I say on site, what does that mean? Well, you know, with with defence, for instance, we're we're putting them on the front line with defence to to help them um, with broken parts they have. You know, with the oil and gas industry, getting it out to the oil rigs, um, putting them on ships with marine. Um, you know, it's actually getting these this technology as close to the to the front line, whatever that may be, as as possible. That's really where where we're seeing a lot of demand at the moment. It's it's not about the cost of the part, it's it's the cost of not having that part. So if you've got a a um, mining facility and your conveyor belt goes down, you know, how much is that going to cost you per hour? So, mm. you know, and how much would you then want to be able to have that technology right next to that conveyor belt? So for, for us, we're finding this this world of getting as close to the front line or as close to the customer as possible, like literally getting it into their factories or, or you know, onto their ships or, or wherever they may be. That, that's some of the keys we're finding. Yeah. Maybe a, a word to, to the audience because, um, yeah, unfortunately, this is Zoom. We much uh, prefer having this uh, in, a, in a room, interactive and the like. So um, maybe to be clear, the, the only way you will be able to ask questions through the, the chat box. And I, I, I was just checking then, and there's not a whole lot that has come through, um, which I, I think may be just a function that um, maybe we haven't made it uh, clear enough because uh, uh, I would uh, anticipate that there are, um, you know, some questions you may want to direct to Byron or Roseanne um, directly. So uh, a, a really a heart, um, heartfelt invitation to fire up a few questions because that would be, I think would really enrich um, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the session. Uh, but, uh, you know, whilst we're waiting for, for, for that to, to happen, um, you know, the, the close relationship with uh, customers um, uh, has, has come up, but, uh, uh, you know, are, are you tempted by decentralized distribution models or do you just really value that, that um, you know, your employees really working, talking to customers directly? Roseanne, you, you mentioned, you know, um, B2C, uh, that, that that breaks the chain. So can, can, the, can the two, can B2C and decentralized distribution coexist for hidden champion? If you ask me, yes, <laughs> they can coexist, and they've got to co got to coexist, really. Mm. Um, but there has been a huge hesitancy um, towards embracing that within within pills, because mm. you know we really, at the core, 
want to have those conversations with the customers directly. We want to understand their problems. We want to listen to their challenges. And, and it's only through that that we can innovate in the right direction if we get that direct feedback. So it's super important to, to us that we have a direct presence, but that doesn't mean it can't be complemented um, with distribution and Australia is a, a really great example of that we're um, you know we're relatively small and, and the cost to put people in every state is um, it's a challenge for us uh, but we can partner to deliver where we and, and we've got some long-term partnerships like Texel over in Western Australia we've been partnering with them you know almost for as long as we've been a subsidiary here um, and they represent us really well and uh and so, and they, they were actually one of the early ones to come onto our authorized distributor um, program, actually, Global Program for Pills. So, and that official program was only released a few years ago. That's, that kind of tells you the hesitancy we have towards going through channel versus a uh, distribution channel versus that direct relationship that we can hold with our customers. What's your view, Byron? Uh, for, for us, um, we, we have a bit of a hybrid model. We, we go through distributors and, and then we go direct as well. It's, for us, it's mainly about the size of the market and, um, and, and the geographical region. So there, there's obviously, for us, the, the expansion, you know, even in Europe is, is a, a large thing to do. So you look at that alone, there's multiple languages, multiple regions. We, we couldn't, we don't have the resources to be able to put people in each of those resources, in, in each of those countries. So having distributors for us is is um, important, um, but it's still a high tech product. So, so then you know how do you train your distributors? How do, how do you get your distributors understanding your product? It's, it's a, you know it, it's something that we are um, working towards. We don't have the correct um, all the answers on that at the moment, but certainly it's a it's a hybrid system for us today. Okay, well, uh, there are questions now coming through um, the chat box, which is nice. Um, and one of them is on uh, company values uh, and, and to what degree uh, can they, um, you know, work going global or do you need to need to adjust? Um, maybe let's start with you, Byron. Yeah, we, we have... Um... We have values which we talk about every month at the company. So even even as an early stage company, um, we highlighted the both the values of the company and 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 what our mission is. You know why do we exist? And and that's to make manufacturing easier. It's a very simple mm -hmm. one. Um, and and those values we do talk about um, every month at uh, our communication meeting and and to to really drill them home to everyone. Um, and, and then as a, as a company is how do we then externally uh, communicate those values as well. So I think values are very important and, and it's something that even you know, a small company like us, you, you've got to really uh, put your values out there and, and, and let people know why you exist. And, and that's very important then in retaining and recruiting the best talent. Is that Likewise, constant repetition, <laughs> um, but partly because we're constantly checking that we're doing what we say we want to do. You know, we have we have this lovely vision that the spirit of safety, and then you know, each subsidiary then has to translate that into what what does that mean for them? How do we represent that vision when when we say to customers, well, with a spirit of safety, you know, are we being ambassadors of safety, which means giving back to the community, um, participating in in chambers like this and, and sharing our knowledge, um, not always for profit. Um, you know, so, so are, we, are we living that, those, those values all the time? We're checking that, you know, have we got some trusted partnerships? Are we being innovative and helping our customers move forward with their challenges? Um, all rolling back to that core theme of, of um, our core vision that we have globally, which is the, the spirit of safety. Okay. Now, wonderful. Um... Now, really, uh, you know, in the middle part, we, we asked about when things um, um, did get tough and, and that, that resonated uh, uh, with part of the, the audience uh, who, who, you know, where the question is, um, can you almost anticipate or prepare yourself um, for things, um, you know, going tough? And maybe, Byron, for you to start, because um, inevitably, when you go uh, global, um, there will be rough uh, patches. Um, 
yes, you can, um, and you need to. So, um, you know, we, no, no one has a crystal ball um, about what is going to happen, but you need to be aware that you're going to spend too much. You're, you're going to make mistakes along the way. Um, and, and it's really about then empowering your staff wherever they are to, to make those decisions. And, and yeah, if they make mistakes, it's, it's learning from them, either them or, or, or from, from head office. You know, maybe we haven't communicated correctly um, about a certain issue. Um, so, um, so anticipating is, um, you, you just gotta be aware, um, and, and react relatively quickly or well, as quickly as you can. Um, you know, for us, a company of 50, we, we can, we can move ship very, very quickly. Um, you know, for, for the large organizations, it takes more time, but you still got to be able to change when, when the situations, uh, come up. Yeah. Roseanne, you, I think you gave some of the answer already because you said like, you know, you, you took the employees, you know, on for the long journey and they stayed with you, but uh, is, there, is there anything else? Um, well, I, I think, you know, as part of that question, how do you maintain the goal when things get rough? I think the, that is absolutely key when things get rough, that you do not take your eye off the goal and get distracted and, and maintain that focus. Um, if you've got a little distracted, drop those distractions. And, and we definitely saw Pills do that over these last few years. We were looking at robotics, for example, and building our own little robots. And it was an R&D. And we spent a, a fair amount of money in R&D looking at that. And uh, when times got tough, you know, what are we good at? Well, actually, there are other companies that do robotics far better than us. We, you know, we can use our safety con um, consultants to ensure that the, the world of cobots remains safe for the human working around the robot. Um, and so we didn't drop that part of our core focus. But, you know, when times get tough, retract back to, you know, what are you good at? You'll, you'll have loyal customers everywhere and, and they will stick with you as long as you stick with what you are good at and what's giving you that global brand and global presence in the first place. So um, maintaining the goal is what you do when you are, when things get rough. Oh, that's interesting too, with, you know, that concept of going deep, vertically deep into the supply chain, mm -hmm. but that might yeah. be an area when funds dry up, then, well, you focus on the core focus and, on and the leave core leave the um, some part of the supply chain to those that do it best. Um, here's a question from uh, someone obviously well known to us uh, in the chamber, Raphael Koenig. Um, and uh, yeah, he, uh, he points out um, the uh, strong points of the hidden champions, clearly knowledge and skills of the employees. And um, yeah, he's just looking for um, some, some ideas, um, how, how you replicate that, that aspect in, in, in Australia, maybe starting with you, Byron. Um, so for us, it is uh, delegation of responsibility and, and giving people control and ownership. Um, so when we went, I'm going to go the opposite way because we started in Australia, of course, and went the other direction. Um, for us, yeah, the markets of Germany, let, let's say our, our two big overseas markets is Germany and the US. You know, you'd expect them to be similar, which they are, but they have their own intricacies and, and their own requirements and, and really then empowering the people in those regions to make some decisions and, and to say, I need this. Um, and you know, what you guys do in Australia is interesting, but it's not gonna suit us. Um, and, and so then, having getting delegating the responsibility to to our overseas leaders and saying you know bring back your, your challenges your problems we may not solve them all but you know, we're, we're here to help you so um i'm going to say it the other way it, it's really about delegation and and yeah you know, your employees will and should know best hmm. so is it is it really uh you know you mentioned a, a growing workforce and you know, you have that picture of hidden champions where the matriarch or patriarch, you know, still is on the floor training the new gener generation. Um, you know, is, is that part, part of it? And, and, and uh, you know, once you, you create that skill base internally that, that increasingly goes along the journey and, and sees the cool things that, that you, you generate that, that sort of, um, yeah, creates the, um, you know, the Australian 
uh, spirit and and Australian um, employees um, that that bring you know something special to to the supply chain that you um, you can't can't sort of find anywhere else. I, I think for us it's a, it's about getting the knowledge into as many people's heads as possible. So um, certainly as a founder. Um, customers love speaking to the founders um, and, and that's our role. Um, but as we get bigger and bigger, the, the knowledge is not in our heads as the founders' heads anymore. It, it, it's spread across the team um, and it's the team that then trains the, the rest of the team. So as you grow, it's making sure that um, we, yeah, you empower your staff to then make the decisions which are correct because um, uh, maybe our roles change as founders. You know, it's talking to customers, it's getting out there, it's, it's not doing the technology anymore. And, and you just need to, uh, a, a, as you grow, change what you do and and um, and let, you know, let others make mistakes that we've all done in the past. And again, I think that's, you know, if you look at the show builds that uh, uh, Professor Simon has generated, um, the, the, the strong leadership is in the center. So, you know, and, and I think you as the CEO and, and co-founder uh, will always be in the center, but then the, the trick, uh, how all the other parts come to life very much is through uh, qualified employees as well, as I read the, uh, the, uh, the schema that, that he has uh, generated. And it's the employees that, you know, create the uh, touch point and the close relationship to the, to the customer. Uh, you know, they create the ideas and the in innovation and we spoke about um, you know, the, the, the patent, patent density per thousand employee at low cost, et cetera. So it is, it, yeah, leadership and, and you as the founder, absolutely in the center, but then, you know, creating skills, knowledge um, in the organization is, is, is then uh, creating the longevity and, and allowing you to uh, grow the company. And I think, Rosen, you answered that question um, when I quizzed you around succession planning and just said like there's just so much talent um, a, a around the globe that that carries the knowledge and um, you know whilst there is you know that central spirit of, of what pills stand for and, and what the focus is then the decentralized model um, you know uh, creates the knowledge and skills of em employees so not, not sure whether that directly um, gives the holy grail how to you know get a strong skill base in, in Australia, but I think it's the, the principle where employees stick around for longer um, and that, that uh, translate into a broader and um, uh, skill base that then is actually the, the secret weapon for, for um, success. Perhaps also, you know, companies like Pills, we, we, you know, we're an SME, we're less than half a billion uh, globally. We're sitting at about 400 million euros of turnover annually. So we're not a huge company. Um, and, you know, across 40 um, international subsidiaries, some of us are quite small and, you know, we don't have the luxury, although we're the gold standard, we can't gold plate <laughs> our, our rates and our products to such an extent that we have the luxury of, buy, of, of buying out of the labour market the most experienced people that exist in Australia. We have to grow our own. And I think that's where Germany does it really well through that retention and and. Of, of talent and therefore that depth of knowledge that sits within the company, they quite readily hire straight out of high school. They have a huge intake each year, actually, Pills do into Osfelden um, of high school leavers and and uh, it, it's hugely successful. They, they move their way through lots of different departments and, um, and then over time become that next generation of, of uh, of, of, of pilses <laughs> that, then, that then teach future generations. So I think that's key and, I, and I'm not sure, I hear different, I hear mixed messages in Australia as to how well we are doing that in terms of bringing that talent pipeline through, connecting to schools, to high school leavers with apprenticeship programs, um, all the way through to the graduate level programs. Uh, you know, we've just taken an, a, a school leaver and an apprentice, um, at the beginning of this year and uh, uh, our apprentice Rolf is doing a digital apprenticeship so there you go there's a, yeah. a hidden champion that's uh, <laughs> yeah. that's hired someone to do a digital <laughs> apprenticeship. So um, you explained that yeah you explained that in Germany you're in Stuttgart right so that's not uh, exactly countryside but what you just mentioned then like getting in touch with students early 
um, for those sitting champions that are more remote, they, they know quite early, um, yeah. even at school level, where there's talent um, and they very much keep in, in contact um, when they go to university and then make sure they come come home and a lot of them like coming home. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of levels and, and probably not one, one single uh, answer. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not rushing completely, but we, we are getting towards the end. Um, and, and there's, I think there's an interesting question come through, um, you know, how do you, um, keep on top with the latest innovation because we we we, we create this um you know this uh, 3d uh, as a uh, speed 3d you almost think it's like uh, blue sky leadership you know no one can catch you or the like but um there must be an element uh, where even hidden champions sort of look at the next big thing the the latest innovation etc so um how, how do you keep up with um the latest innovation and is that in your field, or do you go broader than that? Um, for for us, um, you know, we we are a company of uh, I would um, I, I would think about three quarters of our staff are engineers, um, and um, a huge proportion of them are just passionate about what we do and, in, and interested in in um, technology and innovation. So I'm certainly interested in technology and innovation as well and keep a, a, a close eye on it. But if I miss something, I can almost guarantee that uh, whatever has come out, there'll, there'll be a, an email or, or a link in my inbox that, that next day about whatever is happening out there. So um, it probably comes back to the culture of the company. We, we live and breathe innovation. That's how we succeed and, and that's what we do. So it's not something that we... Um, we, we even think about, I, I think it's just what we do every day and, and, it's, um, and it's how we exist. So um, I, I you know, innovation to us is, is like breathing or drinking. It's just part of what we do every day. Okay. Likewise with pills, um, you know, we invest heavily back into R&D. Uh, at least 20% of our profits will go back into R&D every year. And, um, and, you know, uh, the Pills family, I've had a few discussions with them around this because they've got a very proud history of innovation and world first for a, for a company that's not really that well known. Um, and, uh, you know, their passion towards moving the company forward is, uh, is unwavering, very curious, uh, full of engineers too throughout Pills, I've got to say, uh, myself included. And um, uh, I think expanding on that, they are very watchful of other sectors. So how do you keep up with the latest innovation in your sector? Well, they watch other sectors. They look at what's happening in automotive. What new components might they be using in cars these days? Could we bring that into the automation space? Um, what new components are they using in the space sector, in the defense sector? Is there something we can learn from those other sectors uh, in terms of the materials they're using, their approach to manufacturing? the wonderful stuff that Byron is bringing out now. Um, it's maintaining that curiosity across all sectors and seeing whether that, those, those uh, use cases could be brought into our niche. Not a real surprise that trade shows are very successful in Germany, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, that cross-pollination. That's right. Okay, well, um, we, we, we're almost at the point where we um, can bring it to a close. So I think, uh, uh, I enjoyed myself uh, throughout. It's it's such a positive um, topic. Hopefully, um, you know, for those that that still have to go abroad, uh, it has uh, created uh, energy. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's not easy. We found that. Um, uh, uh, Byron, I think, uh, was really a nice uh, connection to the start uh, when uh, Tim uh, Dillon um, said, "Look." Um, uh, the the Victorian government uh, uh, is there to help you, um, whether in Germany or, or Europe or the UK. Um, and Byron, you compare, uh, you know, said, I don't do it alone. You know, use the agencies to help you ask questions, uh, get the support, um, uh, etc. So I think um, that linked in quite quite well. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Setinik said the same. You know, the the, the chamber has a great network. Um, it uh, very much is aligned with uh, what Victoria and the Australian um, 
industry is about. So there's a wealth of resources of, um, you know, whether it's food or bedroot or hydrogen or the latest technology, um, absolutely here to, to help uh, uh, as well. Um, uh, look, uh, to have such wonderful examples, both from Germany inbound. Uh, Roseanne, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and, and, and being uh, free with your advice. Um, uh, and saying to you, uh, barring going the, the other ways, not once, but twice. Um, I, I think we, we covered a great journey. I think um, it is a matter of engineers and uh, I hope a lot of engineers listened in. Um, it's not about the profit, it's about the technology, reinvesting in the technology, firming, believing uh, in your technology, um, holding the, the, a steady hand, um, being prepared for hiccups, uh, things can go wrong. Um, but if you treat your employees in particular well, they, they will stick with you. Um, and then when things start uh, ticking along again, they're with you to, to help, you, uh, help you grow. Um, we spoke about niche markets, but you know the um, niche market might be narrow, but the industry application uh, is potentially endless. Um, and uh, we spoke about uh, at the very end, uh, yes, you have market leading technology, um, but uh, that is not to say that you don't look at the, the late, late, next big trend, uh, whether you then will, uh, uh, you know, imitate it or follow it or lead it again, um, but you certainly are, are looking out for the next big thing in the industries that you cover. Um, and so, um, and you and your fellow um, engineers uh, in your companies never sit still. Um, and I think uh, what, what is taking me and, and what uh, captured me is, is your, your energy uh, the way you uh, are aligned with uh, your company and, and what your company is trying to achieve. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, we do this more often and uh, come up with, uh, uh, you know, exciting examples. I'm, I'm sure we will. I have a lot of um, confidence in the Victorian um, uh, industry and, and manufacturing. Um, and uh, what I did like about uh, what Tim said is like the, the close relationship really uh, between um, Victoria and Germany um, and, uh, you know, Germany being the number one export market for Victoria. So if you're looking um, for world expansion and critical markets, um, don't forget to look at Germany as well in um, starting your German journey as a, to become a hidden champion. So I, um, I think I can either hand over back to the, um, the chamber team. Um, I'm not sure whether it's uh, my, my job to, to close, but um, I think we had a full one and a half hours. So I don't think we would want to go over time. So Michael, um, back to you. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Rolf, for your very insightful and uh, thought-provoking questions as the MC today. And of course, a huge thank you to Roseanne and Byron for sharing um, your deep insights of, of how to become a hidden champion. And uh, I'm sure this will be very helpful for many of our participants today and uh, will lead to more Victorian companies going into overseas markets. And of course, we are absolutely delighted, um, Tim, for the support through Global Victoria and also, of course, through yourself, um, welcoming us today and really outlining the great support for Victorian businesses available through Global Victoria on this journey into international markets and uh, particularly, of course, uh, interested in into German markets, um, which of course Byron was was really sharing a great success story from that. And Roseanne, thank you also again for your insights um, into um, uh, the the uh, secrets of how Pils is such a globally leading um, company coming out of a middlestand company and truly uh, 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 the best of of what hidden champions can be. So thank you so much. Um, um, Tim, is there anything you would like to um, to add to farewell our participants today? Uh, thanks, Michael. No, no, nothing to add other than a, just a, a huge thank you to you and your team, Sonia, organising it. And Rolf, great job uh, moderating, covered a lot of ground there. And um, yeah, Roseanne and Byron, um, fabulous case studies and, you know, hands-on advice. So uh, thank you. And um, please reach out, people, to Global Victoria um, and our officers to provide support. We work closely um, not only with Austrade, but also the Chambers of Commerce and so on. So, you know, our goal is to make it smooth as possible for you to, to enter these markets and clear some of the obstacles. So thanks very much. 
Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, Tim, and that is really greatly appreciated. And um, as you pointed out earlier, this is the first of a series of events we are offering for our Victorian businesses. The next one on 24th of February will be how to enter the post-COVID German supply chain. Uh, we will be sharing details about that event and how to register with all uh, participants uh, from today's event, um, so that hopefully you can all um, attend that event as well. And then, of course, we're also talking about uh, the benefits of the Australia EU free trade agreement and managing German business culture at a later date. So, thank you again, everyone, for participating today and particularly for our outstanding um, panel. Have a great afternoon and uh, a good day in Europe. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. All right.